Welcome to Electron Online. Let's go and explore the energy equation a little bit more now for simple harmonic motion. The concept is that we have a spring and a mass. So let's assume that the surface is frictionless so that no energy loss is in the motion and that the spring being compressed and elongated also does not require any additional energy. In other words, there's no energy loss in the spring's motion. What we're going to do is we're going to push the block up against the spring until we've reached a maximum distance, until we've reached the maximum displacement. We call the maximum displacement the amplitude of the oscillation because once we let go, the block will oscillate between negative A on one side to positive A on the other side. Those are the maximum distances the block will travel away from the equilibrium point. So when we compress the block against the spring, we'll have stored energy in the block, and that energy stored is called the initial energy of the system, and that will be one half k times the displacement, and since a represents the maximum displacement, the maximum energy or the energy initially that we have into, stored into the system is equal to one half k a squared. That goes on the left side of this equation, so the initial energy would be one half k a squared. Now we'll let go of the block, and of course the spring with all that stored energy pushes against the block and begins to accelerate the block away from the initial position here all the way to the equilibrium point. Once it passes the equilibrium point, the block will continue to move, but now we'll slow down because the, block, the spring is beginning to pull on the block and the block will come to a complete stop when it reaches the maximum displacement on the other side that would be x equal to displacement in the positive direction. On its way to that position, the block is still moving to the right and there's some energy stored in the spring. So any snapshot picture of the system will then uh, en enable us to find the total energy stored in the system, which will be a combination of whatever potential energy is in the spring and whatever kinetic energy the block has because of its motion. Only when the block moves to the very end of its, its position, I should say, only when the block moves towards the very end of its motion, when x is equal to the maximum amplitude that it will reach, at that moment the block has zero velocity and then all the energy will be stored in the spring in terms of potential energy. At that point x equals a, and so therefore the total energy in the system is one half k a squared again. And that will happen whenever the block reaches the maximum distance away from the equilibrium point, either on the right side or on the left side. Anywhere else in between, the block will have some kinetic energy as well. When the block passes exactly through the equilibrium point, at that moment there's no energy stored in the spring at all. That's what the equilibrium point means, there's no energy stored in the spring. All the energy will then be contained in the block, which will then have its maximum velocity. So the only energy the block will then have is the kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, when the velocity at that point will be maximum. That means that all of the initial kinetic energy will then st be stored completely in the kinetic energy of the block. In any other position, it will be a combination of kinetic energy and potential energy until again the block reaches the far points of its path when it reaches the maximum amplitude on the right side or the maximum amplitude on the, ref on the left side. There's no kinetic energy. All the energy will then be stored in terms of potential energy. So what we're going to do is here, the energy final, meaning that at any point along its path, the energy will be a sum of its potential energy stored in the spring. It will be less than the total energy that it had in the beginning, plus some kinetic energy. That means on the right side of the equation, we can write 1 half kx squared plus 1 half mv squared. If we now solve this equation for v, that means we need to move this to the other side of the equal sign, turn the equation around, and by the way, it looks like every term has a one-half in it. That means we can get rid of the one-half in every term, move this to the left side, turn the equation around, that gives us mv squared is equal to ka squared. Moving the kx squared to the other side becomes minus kx squared. Notice I can factor out a k on the right side, I can divide both sides by m, I get v squared is equal to k divided by m times the quantity a squared minus x squared, so I factor out a k, divide both sides by m. Now when I take the square root of both sides, I get v, which is a function of x, is equal to plus or minus the square root of k divided by m times the quantity a squared minus x squared. When you look at this, you can see that the velocity will be zero 
when x equals a. The velocity will be a maximum value when x becomes zero. And then you can calculate what that velocity would be. We can also solve this equation for v. Or, no, we just did for v, for x. That's what I wanted to say. We can also solve this equation for x. When we do that, we get the following. So moving over here, we're going to isolate this, move the mv squared to the other side. So we get kx squared, that's this right here, is equal to ka squared minus mv squared when that goes to the other side of the equation. Now again, like before, in this case, we're going to divide both sides by k. x squared is equal to k divided by k is 0, or no, I should say 1, it just disappears. So we simply get a squared minus m over k times v squared. So I just simple, simply divided all three of the terms by k. Now we take the square root. So x now becomes a function of velocity, which is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of a squared minus m over k times v squared. Finally, so let, let me go ahead and box these two equations. So that's how we derive the two equations, one for the velocity as a function of position, and the other one position as a function of velocity. The third equation, the acceleration as a function of position, can be found by taking both Newton's second law, f equals ma, and the equation, f equals minus kx, also known as Hooke's law, and set those two equations equal to each other, which means that we have m times a equals minus k times x, divide both sides by m, we get a is equal to minus k over m times x, which means that a is now also a function of position, and that's the third equation. These three equations allow us to solve for the velocity, the position, and the acceleration using the energy equation. Exploring a little bit more, again, let's look for the acceleration. The acceleration will be maximum when x is a maximum value. In other words, when x is all the way to the right, and when x equals a, we get the maximum acceleration, which will now be towards the left. That's why we have a negative sign. When x is a negative quantity, when x is on the left side of the equilibrium point, when x equals negative a, then we can see that the acceleration will be positive value to the right, again, a maximum when the when the, the block is either on the left or the right side, x equals a. The acceleration will be zero when x is equal to zero, which means when the block is at the equilibrium point, there's no net force at that very moment, therefore there's no acceleration. Looking at the position, notice when velocity is zero, that means we are either at the far end on this side or far end on that side, when velocity is equal to zero, x is simply equal to plus or minus a. In other words, it's, equal, it's either on the far side to the right at a distance a away from the equilibrium point or a distance negative a away from the equilibrium point. And here, again, looking at velocity, notice we have maximum velocity when x is equal to zero. When x is equal to zero, it's at the equilibrium point. It has zero velocity when x equals a, which means it's on both ends of the, uh, the far ends of the motion, the range of motion at plus or minus a. That will hopefully help you understand these sets of equations. So if you need to use the energy equation to find the velocity, the position, and then of course using Newton's second law and Hooke's law combined to get the acceleration, you then are able to solve for either position, velocity, or acceleration in terms of either position or velocity. That's how we do that. On the next video, we'll explore the other equations where we're trying to find the position, the velocity, and the acceleration as a function of time.